My name is Kaneem Smith. I'm visiting from Houston. And um, I'm, I'm thrilled and honored to be on the show, be part of the show with you all. And um, one interesting thing I could say uh, with connection to the museum and the Dallas, uh, my father is a sculptor, George Smith, from Houston, Texas. He did the sculpture that's out front in the front of the museum. Can you I'm sorry. Uh, my father, George Smith, did the sculpture out front of, from the museum. So that's my interesting fact. <laughs> so yes. I'm Classy Nance G. Well, we're all one of the artists, right? Interesting <laughs> fact is I'm a time traveler. Oh, wow. <laughs> Very hurt for me. <laughs> What's your interesting fact? Oh, my interesting fact. Um, ooh, interesting, interesting, interesting. Um, I teach group fitness also. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Tyra Goodley, uh, metal art sculptress. Uh, one inter interesting fact about me is that I'm currently having a spiritual inspiring connection with a red bird that comes and visits me daily in my backyard. Long enough for me to draw him and have these conversations and, and watch him, you know, feed his family it's just been so wonderful. <laughs> I'm Lauren Cross, um, as Jennifer said, um, and I work primarily in the Denton area as a professor at UAT, um, curate shows um, with other women artists as well. Um, I'm trying to think of a fun fact. Well, I'm pregnant, so that's fun. <laughs> 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 Hi, my name is Tashana. Um, I am, I work with paper, so I guess I'm a paper artist, so that's my medium. And um, I am a single homeschooling mommy. Hi, I'm Choke. Um, it's an acronym, it stands for Creating Her Own Kinetic Energy. A lot of people don't know that, so that can be an interesting fact. Uh, another interesting fact is that uh, recently in the last four years I've been working uh, very closely with uh, specific tribes in Thailand um, and I'm supporting a tribe of women now who create custom bags and different things and it's funny I have this on, um, but uh, to preserve their ancient techniques and their, um, and their art. So, yeah. Hi everybody, my name is Stacy Monday. Um, I am a painter, I use acrylics. It's hard for me to come up with something interesting um, from the top of my head. I guess I could say I am a mom as well. I have a six year old and we're currently battling because she's been dropping hints that she wants a sibling. <laughs> so on my Mother's Day card, she drew some extra children. <laughs> Valerie Gillespie. Um, I'm a painter as well. Also, I guess, interesting fact for me, I'm stepping outside of my comfort zone a bit and I am opening up my own gallery. It opens on June 1st in Addison and I am scared shitless. <laughs> but excited for this new, this new journey in my life. Hi, I'm Yolanda Burton and I'm from Dallas as well. And um, interesting fact about me, I've been in art education for 27 years, uh, of which I have three teachers. My own children mm -hmm. are teachers as well. Mm -hmm. oh, and I'm interdisciplinary in, in terms of my art. I'm visual, musical, and then I also do sculpture. So. Mm -hmm. Hey everybody, I'm Jay Lachey. Um, interesting, well, I'm from Dallas. Um, Interesting fact, I, my background is actually social justice education. That's what I've been doing for the past 15 years. Um, art was where I started, but I kind of left it to be an activist. Um, and so this show was me re-entering back into the world. Yes. Um, okay, so I guess it's on in now. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's really awesome to be in the room and on the stage with you ladies and to kind of get to know you all. 
um, through this exhibition, um, when, when Jennifer asked me um, about moderating our talk today, I thought this could be more of a, a conversation. Um, I do have some questions to kind of get us going, and then I will open it up to the audience, because I know the audience is probably curious to ask us some questions as well. Um, but I did want us to frame our talk within the context of the exhibition that Jennifer has so amazingly curated on um, the topic of us two, hashtag us two. And so for those of, of, of you who may not be as familiar with the hashtag, the us two movement emerged as a response to the lack of race in the conversation um, within the hashtag me too movement. Um, and I want us to think about that that, that is actually an unjust reality that's been going on you know, for centuries. Um, historically, within every women's movement, there has been some kind of erasure of the experiences of black women, women of color from that narrative. So I want us to think about that we're contributing to this ongoing legacy of reclaiming and retelling our stories. We've been having to continue to keep doing this um, for years. Um, so within that context, we have so many different black women throughout history and culture that have been contributing their activism, their creative arts um, to, you know, bring that, fill that, that gap in knowledge that, that's there. Um, thinking about Sojourner Truth from Ida B. Wells, Maya Angelou, into more contemporary um, renditions of that. Um, and I love Jennifer's curatorial statement, which talks about how all of us um, as artists are contributing our creative voice to that narrative as well. So I think that's pretty powerful. I don't know about you all. Um, that this is a legacy that we're contributing to. Um, and, and in different ways, we're all contributing in our different narratives, our different approaches uh, within the 70 work sets and the show. So my first question, I told Jennifer I was gonna, I was gonna push on her first, <laughs> was to um, really ask you, Jennifer, about really the background of the show, how it kind of came to be, and um, selection of artists, because I'm okay. sure many of the audience would love to know that. Well, um, I started working on the show back in September. I started with the museum September 15th of last year. And I was asked by Dr. Robinson to come on um, as a curator here at the museum. Um, granted, I never, I do not have a curatorial background. Um, I do have a degree in art, um, but it was, I was up for the challenge. And it sounded exciting, so he said, I want you to create a women's show. So I started back in September and was trying to figure out whether or not I wanted um, it to be a retrospect or something that had some bite to it. And I went with something that had some bite to it because I didn't want it to just be a retrospect. So I had the challenge of trying to come up with a title. <laughs> so I contacted all these artists, uh, and there were a few other artists, um, but when I was getting all the slides in, I decided to contact them and say, okay, we need to do a studio visit as well. <laughs> because some of the ladies, I did not know them. There was, there's some up here that like Tyra, we go back like 20 plus years. In Classy, we go back like 20 plus years. But some of the other ladies, I did not know them. So I wanted it to be more personable and I wanted to sit down and chit chat and get to know them on a deeper level. And also see their uh, Cedar Studios because I'm all for that because I'm a creative person so I want to see the uh, creative creative space and so in those conversations that I had with all 19 ladies I'm like wow we're gonna be friends we're gonna be in each other's lives forever <laughs> you know and um, when I met all the ladies and then just threw the title out there, they were just they were just excited, just super, super excited. And the title actually came from my husband, Edlin, who is sitting in the audience because I was trying, to, I kept coming back to Maya Angelou. I kept coming back to Maya Angelou and I wanted to do something with 
uh, Phenomenal Woman, the poem. And then my husband, who watches CNN, CNN religiously and any other news program that is on, he handed me this memo. <laughs> and he said, this should be your title. And it said, hashtag us two ain't all woman. And then he told me about Brett Kavanaugh, because I don't watch the news that often, because it's too, it's too depressing. And I, I'm, I'm a Pollyanna, so <laughs> I prefer to think of butterflies and flowers and things like that. So, <laughs> so he uh, presented me this title, and I was like, I love it. So I started to do more research on the title and found out that Bette Mittler put this statement out there in her frustration about Brett Kavanaugh being confirmed as Supreme Court Justice. And she said that women are the N-word of the world, and then she said some other things, and she wasn't intentionally being racist, but her, her, her statement was a backhanded insult to African American women in particular. So there was another journalist who said, Hashtag us too, ain't our woman, based on the supposed speech that Sigourney Truth made. So a lot of people did not know that Bette Miller was quoting a song from John Lennon and Yoko Ono from the 70s that said women are the niggers of the world. So I want to take that and spin it onto something positive to celebrate African American women in general and just everything that we represent because um, throughout history we've done a whole lot and we're fabulous and we want everyone to know that we are not going anywhere and that we're here to stay with all our unapologetically as F <laughs> attitude, our everything, our power, our everything. So um, that's what the title encompasses, all of that. And just that we're here and we're not going, going anywhere. And I wanted all the artists to be local because I think it's important that, um, that we have a voice. Because there are lots and lots of artists right here in town. And I, I love that Kaneem is in the show because she has deep roots here also. Because her father has the sculpture sitting right in front of the museum. Mm -hmm. And I think that this, 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 um, these little musical notes create this beautiful, this beautiful song um, that we see upstairs. So um, that's my little talk, and I'm sorry I rambled <laughs> a little bit, but um, that's a little bit of the history of how the title came to be. Wonderful. So. Thank you so much You're welcome. for, for mm -hmm. pulling us in on all that. Um, I wanted to open it up to you artists to, for you to share what the hashtag us to movement means to you in relationship to your work or just it could be personal or anything in relationship to, to the movement that you want to talk about. Okay, well. <laughs> Uh, when Jennifer told me about the hashtag, or not the hashtag, the title of the show, the uh, evolution of the show, my work is a work that is, has my name on it, so go check it out, Classic Nancy Gmo. <laughs> so I don't know, it's a multimedia work that is photography. But uh, mine is specifically an ode to Little Kim because in this Us Too and Me Too movement, um, the least of these I've always felt just left out. So the least of these to me is that I believe, I, I believe strongly that um, uh, sex workers deserve the care and the love of the us to the me too. I believe strongly that the people that are represented that you might not agree with their, how they present are represented. So um, the raunch that I bring is very intentional. So that is why I brought it forth. It was very intentional and very thought about. Um, and then I also noticed that we've always, there's always a certain level of care and presentation, even in the midst of trauma that we bring to it. And so we have these traumatic existences, but we're more than just this trauma. So there, all of these layers, and it's shown through the show. It's like you walk in, 
you're, you know, you're celebrating, you're mourning, you're crying, you're laughing, you're rejoicing, you're dancing, you know, it's, you're hugging, you're like, wait a minute, it's all of these different experiences and we're cyclical people, so it's okay if one day I want my dukes on and then the next day I'm a first lady. That's okay. And so that's very intentional and I think it's intentional in speaking with Jennifer, like the, the wide array of artists that are represented in the wide array of work. So I guess for me, that's what the us two kind of pulls out. I guess for me, um, for so long, I've grappled with, do I want to sell work or do I want to make work? Mm -hmm. And um, I found myself in a place where I, creating work that I knew would sell and appease certain artists and, and audiences or galleries or um, museums or wherever I was showing. But when Jennifer approached me with this title and um, this, this, this topic in particular, it spoke to me. And for the first time in a very long time, I found myself creating work for myself. Mm -hmm. um, and also the fellowship in the community that I found with this group of women and this strong and passionate theme, it's, it's, I, I just cannot thank you enough. It's, it's awakened something just very deep and powerful in me. Um, I, I just have a drive that I haven't had before from, from this, <laughs> this show. Um, it's, it's amazing how much power is in a title. There's just so much that each of our work brings in. And, and for me, it, it, it's done a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'd like to share. Um, this, this show and the title, Us Two, um, for me personally, my journey as a woman, as a black woman, as a professional artist uh, who has never worked for anyone. I became a professional artist straight out of college and never looked back. Um, this show has been very confirming to me that I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. A lot of women, me personally, I work full time as an artist. So I wake up doing art, I go to sleep doing art. I have four beautiful children that I, you know, teach this whole idea too about being your own boss, being an entrepreneur, providing jobs, and um, that's very important to me. So to, to know that right here in my city of Dallas, there are so many black women artists that are, where it's similar in age, similar in, in perspectives, similar in struggle. Um, we have gotten together several times on several occasions you know, we've gotten, had opportunities to share our, our, our guilt and our pleasures and our shame. And I think more than anything, more than just showing, uh, having our works and, and putting them in the exhibit here for the public to see, we have really connected on a deeper level which allow us to feel um, supported. Um, as black women, um, if you are a black woman, you probably already know this, uh, a lot of us are the matriarchs of our families, of our lineage, and of our legacies. We carry a great, um, large responsibility, not only to our families and to our ancestors, but to the planet itself. Our strength has held, held the, has been the glue and the solidifying factor of the black family, family for so long. And a lot of times, you know, we hide in the shame of, of. Um, being supporters and being available and being consistent, you know, as uh, mothers and as wives and as sisters, that we forget about these awesome talents that have been given and gifted to us to share. So I'm I'm just um, so honored to know that um, that all of us are here and we have these these energies that we can transmute into beautiful pieces of art and celebrate, you know, this, this struggle that, that we are managing. We're actually figuring out ways to, to be, this show is one example of it, to be audacious, to be unapologetic, to be forthright in our talents and our gifts. So hopefully this is an encouraging factor to not just black women, but women in general. 
and I'm speaking specifically of women, to women in general because women need that permission. We need that green light from other women that it's okay. It's okay to say, hey, I'm not cooking today. <laughs> you know, I, I can't do the laundry. It's just got to sit up there and wait. I don't, know, I don't know what's going on. All I know is that what's in me is, is years and years and decades and decades of stories that have to come forth through me from my art. So that is the statement. Overall, I think that uh, a lot of us can agree that we're making is that we're not just speaking for our personal selves, we're speaking for our grandmothers and our great grandmothers and, 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 and you know, so many ancestors that never got to show forth their talent this way. So we thank you all for even being here to see, hear the background, not just to see the art, but to come and to hear our stories. That's very valuable to us because it, again, it, um, it confirms that, you know, we are supported by each other. So thank you. And thank you. Yeah. And I think what you just said is pretty much exactly what I think about, um, um, especially when um, Jennifer mentioned about the us two hashtag for me. Much of my work has been about reaching back and thinking about my my great grandmother, my grandmother, and thinking about the opportunities they did not have um, to be able to be creative, to be able to call themselves artists. And so my work is about, you know, me, you know, these generations later saying, yes, she was an artist. Yes, she was an artist. Um, and yes, she saw, and this is her signature, you know, um, and, and really putting them within the art historical conversation that, um, it just doesn't really exist, especially being a Southern woman. I think, for me, um, there's there are many other um, Black women artists that are in other parts of the country, and so I feel like there is a very significant story, like being from the South, um, and that experience, and your ancestors being from the South, and that experience that um, I don't really see in art history at all. And so for me, it was like. Um, you know, growing up in this warm, awesome environment, East Texas, I don't know if there's any other East Texas people in the room, um, and just having that upbringing and just feeling like, wow, like, this is just so ri rich, you know, and then comparing that to what you're learning in an art history classroom and just saying, this is not like, I don't see this, right? Um, and really being angry about that for a while. Like, hey, this is not fair, you know. My ancestors, their experiences are not being represented here. And so my earlier work was more about like, I'm mad about that, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm mad about that, like your stories aren't there. And then I think there was a point where I was like, well, you kind of have to be that person mm -hmm. to now put, put them into the conversation. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was really excited about the theme because I was like, yes, us too. Melinda Wade, my great grandmother, her too. Um, Daisy May Lucas, yes, her too. You know, and you know, not educated. You know, didn't get a chance to go to college, but they they made an awesome impact in their families. So, when I think about uh, the title and the show, and also. Uh, touching on what you said and also Tyra. Creating artwork, especially in this region, it, it can be extremely isolated when you don't see yourself represented. And so I believe that this gives us an opportunity to establish a narrative, to begin to show our city that this is the talent that exists. These are the people that are existing. These are the experiences that they're having. And collectively, in the title, in the show, we have an opportunity to actually sound a call to other women, like you said, to give them permission, but also to show them through what we do. A lot of my artwork will show a person looking up, reaching up, as if experiencing their life, but also knowing that there's another, another place that we've got to go to. And so when I think about our show, we've kind of stepped into another region, another 
uh, landing, so to speak. And in that landing, we are the ones that are, are that the younger people will be able to see. You know, I have, I told you, I've done a lot with art education, and I teach at Carter High School right now. And so some of my students, you know, have had an opportunity to come over and see the show. Mm -hmm. And the show is very powerful to them, and so many questions, uh, and, and the, the same questions that I've been getting throughout the years, well, why are all the people black? And you may think that that's a very simple question, but it is extremely deep because everything that they see in the classroom is not. Mm -hmm. And so in this, we have an opportunity to establish things like curriculum that could actually go forward mm -hmm. to teach the next generations. This is who we are. This is who we always have been, but this is what has been excluded. And I think a part of that discussion and teaching them how that exclusion took place actually gives them a little bit more power to understand, okay, even though I don't see this in action, this is where I can be. Because a lot of times the children learn, okay, I can become anything I want to be. You know, everybody tells the kids, oh, you can be anything you want to be, but then they don't teach them how to accomplish it. They don't actually reach and, and show them. And whether it's the children, and then when they grow up, they become the women. And so I know from the experience of meeting all of you all, it's like it was so refreshing to see the artists here because everybody had a similar story. Everybody had a similar voice. I was not alone. You know, and, and in, I've been doing like shows and contests in the Dallas area here. And in seeing the people who would win, those that would rise, it was a very misogynistic view. Mm -hmm. And so for me, actually seeing the wealth and the depth of talent that was here, it actually brings about a total new concept for me uh, that I already know is it, it's brewing. You know, I, I'm trying to figure this out, but with the phenomenal women, like you said, you give other women permission to be just that phenomenal. Mm -hmm. You know, black, white, Hispanic, whatever. You give other women the ability to stand up and claim that place that they already have since mm -hmm. I'm So uh, my next question is about, um, this is kind of an interesting um, debate, I guess, um, that you all may have encountered or may not have encountered. Um, I know for me, um, there, there's people often ask the question of whether or not one should be um, exhibiting in kind of race specific or gender specific exhibitions. Like there, that there can be kind of a contentiousness about that. Um, and will it affect your career? You know, to have, you know, that I was in a women artist show on my CV or in a black artist show on my CV. Um, and obviously, this is a show that is very, you know, it's <laughs> intersectional. It's both race specific and gender specific. So I just wonder what you all thought about that. Um, my personal view is just that I don't care. <laughs> um, obviously, because my, my work is is race and gender specific, so I feel like it would kind of be not, I wouldn't be being honest mm -hmm. to my work if I didn't participate in shows that were about that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been something that people have like brought up several times, like, or if someone asked me to be in a gender specific show, they're like, would you be okay? And it's just like, what is that? Like, why are we tippy <laughs> Um So I just wondered if you all had that experience or, you know, people ever said that to you or just what your thoughts are about that debate? I feel like you said like that. I really wouldn't yeah. <laughs> care what, what anyone thought. I mean, as an artist, I feel like you should, you should do what's from your heart, you know? Mm -hmm. If you're not then, you're, like I said, you're not really being authentic and people can feel the energy behind your art. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, for me personally, I, for all of my art, I draw from, my own experiences is all based off of uh, my journey as a black woman. I mean, I have a piece up there that has a, a white woman and, you know, the, a black woman in it. And I mean, it's just, it was part of my journey. Personally, that, that particular piece, I was a 911 dispatcher at the time. And so um, I was, 
I've always kind of been in solitude, like I, I feeling isolated. So a lot of the things I dealt with on that job and then my personal experiences, that was my therapy to be able to get that out um, onto a canvas and you know just that was my expression at that time for my personal experience so i mean at the end of the day it shouldn't matter what anyone thinks this is if it's meant to be in your show i'll be in your show <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah when i hear the question um i can't answer it from the space of like an artist resident but um I thought immediately about the work that I do and how in my world there will be things like affinity groups. So like we'll have an affinity group for black folks, black women, white folks, Latino folks or whatever. Um, and there's also right alongside that the question of like why do we need to do that? Why do we need to have these affinity groups? Um, and a lot of times that question is based in fear because what has happened to us in the socialization process of America, well, I would just say the world at this point, um, is that we need to die down the differences because people are afraid mm -hmm. of uniqueness. Mm -hmm. um, and so our fear of ourselves and our complexities lead us to then ask questions about people who decide to enact their own complexities. Mm -hmm. So it's like, stop doing that, mm -hmm. because then it requires that I have to look at myself. Mm -hmm. um, so when you ask that question, that's what I was thinking about, how like a lot of times those questions are based in a fear of um, introspection, but we turn it into this external kind of thing of like, well, let me check you because I'm afraid of checking myself. Mm -hmm. You know, to piggyback off of, off of that, you just reminded me of how I stand very firm in this exhibit being Afro-Mexican, so my mother is an Afro-Puerto Rican, my father's Mexican, and having all of that, you know, showing whether I'm showing in a, in a black show or a Mexican show or a white show or whatever type of show, I've always had questions or looks or, you know, you know, I know Jennifer and I have always, we kind of had conversations about this, like, you're too Puerto Rican for the, the Hispanic groups or you're, or, you know, you're too, or for the white groups or you're too black for the white groups or you're this or that, you know, it's too, I'm riding a fine line of I don't know what you quite are or what you know it's like a you don't fit or belong or whatever but I also see too like um, even parts of my Puerto Rican family are, and a lot of you know a lot of black Hispanic is, 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 is a whole group of folks who deny their own heritage because they want to fit into a certain type of narrative and and I, I refuse to do that. I can't, I can't deny my own heritage because of fear. I, I can't do that. My, I have to be this artist. I have to express what my ancestors were doing because they were so talented and there's so much to it that I would, I would be disrespecting eons of, of talent and, and stories and you know, what we have to say if I didn't. So I think that, you know, again, this this kind of gives me confirmation and, and the support and especially with other women in a, you know, in a man's world, you know, in, in this art game, because it's not easy. But yeah. the fact that we even go to each other's houses and we want to have, you know, uh, there, not there, but like a spa kind of <laughs> night, or you know, it is it is there before us all. We, we all talk, we cry, we, we eat together, we you know, we break bread, and and it's valuable because we do need each other. We do, um, we we don't have that. A lot of people don't have that. Period. Mm -hmm. And yeah. especially in this art world, we don't have it because we're so competitive anyway, mm -hmm. trying to get to where we're going. At um, you know, so yeah, back to to the race thing. It, I remember maybe 10 years ago I did a show in DC and it was uh, it was a Christmas show and uh, it was a group of elder uh, aka women and I had all of my like uh, Egyptian type symbol symbolism and stuff and they kind of came up to me and were like why do you have why are you painting all this black stuff and I said well what you know <laughs> like for real like, you know, it, it was just this whole like 
kind of like like that I couldn't do this particular thing. And I said, well, we haven't even sat down to talk. You don't even know who, what, where, and why, how. And just kind of meeting those types of things in different shows or even, you know, like in quote unquote white shows, like Frank likes to say, but you know, just like, like people coming up to me. Like even last night I painted live at a gala event and I was painting a large uterus because we're celebrating women and I wanted to do something that stood out. <laughs> and it did, and it sold. It sold to the highest bidder, which was great. Uh, and, you know, there was a man that came up to me and was like, aren't you afraid that you're gonna offend some people? I said, well, hell yeah, that's what I want to do. I mean, I, you know, our art does cause a reaction and yeah. that's, that's fine. But at the same time, I'm, I want to stand firm and we all stand firm in this. Um, and, and for me a little bit, it, it, it does kind of help to show my heritage, my Puerto Rican, my Afro-Latina, like all of that, that you don't have to shy away from that. You don't have to ignore what is inside, you know, what your blood and your lineage is because there's so, it's so much of that going on and it's, it's, it's sad to me. So. I'd like to, um, at this point, introduce myself. I'm Nicole Angelica. I'm not sure what I missed in the beginning, but I'm going to start by sharing my accent, which is originally from the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. And as I hear the question about identity and it relates to culture and art, I'd like to ask everyone in the audience to engage in something I want to share. And that is, without fear, to place you in a position of meditation. And I'm going to ask that you just close your eyes and hold your fingers like that. And I'm going to speak to you, and I'll ask you to open your eyes again. And as you close your eyes, with your fingers lightly clasped together, I'm going to ask you to feel what my sister artists here are all saying. And I'm going to ask that you thank from your heart, Jennifer, for bringing us all together here. And to think about the topics that we address as we share our experiences as artists with you. And to almost taste the palate in your hearts and hear the voices that are singing. And I now ask that you open your eyes and look to the persons to your left and right. And look at this group of women on the stage and the different cultural identities. And I'm gonna reflect and say to you, as a transplant to Dallas, Texas, for a little less than six years, hailing from the Bahamas, I come from Caribbean roots. And as I've transplanted here, I've often had to fill out an application. The application would say, black, Hispanic, Latino, Caucasian, and then there's the very last box that says other. And don't you know it? I would always click other. Because as each and every one of these ladies speak today, I see myself in each and every one of them. I see myself in each and every one of the races that are shared here today as an audience. And I ask you to reflect because I want you to think about any challenges that you may have had as it pertains to race. I want you to think about it from the perspective of a child. And many of us sitting here today are educators. And I can very much identify with those educators because I too am an educator. And in my country, education was, not, was never the chosen profession. Certainly art was not the chosen profession. There were only four professional options to choose from. It was a doctor, it was an attorney, it was an accountant, and there was the failure of being other. Well, you know what? As I reflect about that other, I listen to the invitation for which I'm very grateful from Jennifer to participate in Phenomenal Women. I don't think I made a decision until the day after the paintings with you. Am I right, Jennifer? <laughs> <laughs> So yes, I was one of the last people to submit my pieces. And the pieces I did share are the Michelle Obama 
the Oprah Winfrey, and the Maya Angelou that is in watercolor upstairs. And that also have words on those pieces that are all originally hand painted. And many people have come and said, is that, is that a stencil? Is that airbrush? What is it? Ladies and gentlemen, it's all hand painted. And as I was painting them, I was thinking about all of these things we're talking about and the racial indifferences and the identities. And then I thought about how unproud my family in the Bahamas originally was of me, of coming to America to be an educator. Because I gained a master's degree, I gained a Juris Doctorate degree, came to America and hated law. I was always a business person and those principles will always stick with me. But what I never was from the heart was an educator until I came to America. In fact, what I did was I painted. And I did a lot of painting. And I made a lot of money. And I had a lot of celebrities and famous people and doctors and lawyers and all those accountants buy my artwork for ridiculous sums of money. And I was proud of myself at the time with the money. And then I started kind of watching my influences and my friends all across the world. And most of them are doctors and lawyers and accountants. <coughs> but for some reason in my mind, they all seemed very unfulfilled. I never had an opportunity to mix and mingle with such a strong, powerful group of African-American background other women as we have here on the stage. And so with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to do something before I continue with my story. And that is, give all of these women a thunderous round of applause. <laughs> and we appreciate you. And we appreciate you more than you know. I traveled. And, and I met an artist in 2012, and his name was Thomas Kincaid. And I was in awe of his work. There was nothing culturally relatable in his work to me. There was no identity there. But if any of you know him, even in 2012, he was a billionaire from his artwork. But he sat in the corner quietly as, at his gallery as I walked in. And he called me and he said, young lady, one moment please. And he, he did my hand like this. He held me and he said, I too have Vitalago. And immediately I was drawn to him. I said, can you tell me more? At that time, my Vitalago had already started. It wasn't as accelerated as it is today, which is all over my body. And he said to me, and always let art be your therapy, as I heard one of my sisters say. I said, I'd like to hear more. He said, you will make money. You will make fame. But as he had rightfully said, most of the people around you, with the money and the fame, are not happy people. He said, I want you to do something. I want you to go outside your home, and I want you to go in your garden and plant a seed. And let that seed grow into a tree. And under that tree, <coughs> cast a shade that you allow others to sit. And I'm not sure what the message meant to me at the time, but I went home and I reflected upon it. When Jennifer called and said, can you be a part of Phenomenal Women exhibition? At first in my mind, I'm, I'm like in a museum, I, I can't make any money, man. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was kind of, I was kind of hesitant about it. But at that same time, I had a student, that I, I had an artist, a professional artist that, that I was working with, who's also a student, who was a student of mine at the time, who also sits on this panel. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna call her name. 
But she sits on this panel and she was getting ready to do a show. And I asked her a question. I said, do you want to do your show to make money? And at first she said, yes. I said, hmm. I didn't, I didn't respond. Later that night, she sent me a text. And, and she said, no, I don't, I don't want to make money. I want to do my show to share. I said, move right along and do so. And I say, to, I say all of that to you to say, as I thought about that artist, Thomas Kincaid, telling me, cast a shade, I think about why I paint today and why I chose to be in Phenomenal Woman. And I chose to be in Phenomenal Woman because I believe that each and every one of us have made, can make, and will continue to make an impact, starting with our youth. And for that reason, I teach. I teach young children from pre-K all the way to adults. And I have found that the greatest joy I have ever experienced in my life has been through the arts and teaching. I'm not teaching how to paint. I'm not teaching how to be artists. But teaching how to get a lifetime of education from the process of art. And in 2014, I started an organization after I decided to leave one of the most, one of the largest independent school districts in Dallas. And that organization is called Kensington Arts and Education. And, and the reason I started that with a business partner, who told me not to tell you all that they are in the room today, <laughs> um, was because I wanted to share more of what Thomas Kincaid said to me, and that is to cast a shade and not try to gain fame, and not try to make money. Because the intrinsic value is greater. And so today, one of the programs that Kensington Arts and Education is sharing is teaching the impact of art therapy, starting with the minds of our youth. And we teach a program that's called Social Emotional Learning Through the Arts. And, and the way we do that is, the school districts are saying literacy, they need to learn to read. Math, they'll be the greatest thing on, on earth, probably accountants, I guess, if they learn to count. But, but what I know that our youth and adults will not have is the ability to make connections and to critically analyze and to have strong and sound characters about themselves as they emerge into the world to be whatever it is they want to be, whether it's an artist or not. And many of us on this panel are, have second careers, and I don't know if for some of us those careers are to survive, which as artists I believe in most cases it is, so that we can make some money just to pay our bills. But, but, but as I have met all of these ladies on this panel, I have never met such a more strong group of women with characters. And I believe it comes from art. And I'm going to share with you that if you've not heard social emotional learning or heard about it, it is the strongest indicator and impact of education that will demand the greatest of skills as one proceeds in life. And that is only through the arts. Because the other subjects teach our children how to pass the test. Am I right, ladies? Mm -hmm. They teach our children how to pass the test. They don't teach our children that it's okay to stand in the back of the room and wait till Jennifer says, Nicole, it's okay to come up on the auditorium, on the stage, and to say please and thank you, and to allow for our elderly to, to get in the door first as we hold it open, and to know that you cannot go anywhere despite the money and the fame if you do not have basic life skills. And so the goal of Kensington Arts and Education is through the arts to allow everyone around us to have a voice, to think critically, to be able to look at these phenomenal women artists and the work that they produce and to dissect it and to say, what is that artist thinking? What, what is this message telling me? And what is that really about? Communication, empathy, compassion, critical thinking skills. It's about all those life skills that we need to progress. And so my business partner, who doesn't want y'all to know that she's in the, in the room, created a book. 
and it's called the testimony. And in this book, there are a lot of paintings by myself, Nicole Angelica, along with Dr. Rose's story <laughs> about what it is that social emotional learning and the arts does. And ladies, the reason I painted Oprah Winfrey, Michelle Obama, and Maya Angelou is because in the generations from now to the ones that I've admired as a child, those are three of the women that I admire greatly. Fortunately, for me as an African-American slash other Bahamian woman, they are African-American women. <laughs> and as I thought about what to present for this show, I thought about how do I impact from the little child to the adult as I present this piece? And as you look at those pieces, I encourage you to read what they say. And one of them says to Lady Michelle Obama, thank you. Thank you for quietly and confidentially going about and showing us as women, as people in the world, who and what it is that we need to be, because I don't believe that there was ever such a more eloquent first lady in the United States, certainly in my lifetime. And I thought that was a message that I wanted to share. And then I wanted to share messages from Oprah Winfrey, whom I greatly admire, whom I believe I um, adopt some of her oratorical skills. <laughs> I, I know, I, I want to make sure you guys don't forget me, because before you leave this room or this exhibit, I'd like you to find Dr. Rowan, purchase one of her books because it does have some of the artwork, which is the cover and the back, which is also my artwork, and it shares what I'm sharing with you about social emotional learning and how it impacts us today. And I wanna take this last minute and very profoundly thank all of you as artists, all of you as Americans, all of you as Puerto Ricans, or Mexicans, or white women, or Caribbean women, or black women, or other women allowing me to share this panel with you. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for listening. Wow. <laughs> um, so Nicole mentioned something that I, is really what I wanted to ask next to our, um, the rest of the panel. And some of you have kind of mentioned it. I think Valerie mentioned um, this notion of to sell or to make, you know, Mm -hmm. for yourself or for the messaging that you feel is the most important. So I wonder if we can kind of unpack that a little bit more because um, I think that um, this is something that is, it's not a, it's not a small thing, mm -hmm. you know, because we're, we talked about the side hustles, the other jobs mm -hmm. and things that you have to do to kind of balance it all out. Um, and so to create work that is really authentically what you want to say, your voice. I think it's important for us to maybe talk about that um, and how it relates to what's in the show today. Um, anyone want to kind of share that process? Um, I know for me, for years, I, I painted things that I thought that people would want to buy. Mm -hmm. um, as I've gotten older, I'm painting things that I want to paint, mm -hmm. and I can basically care less whether you want to buy it or not. Mm -hmm. You either bought, you either want it or you don't, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because I I'm taking more risks now, where I'm coming out of my comfort zone and giving more of me in my artwork, um, in what my journey is and what it has been, and what I foresee um, coming. Um, so, right now, I'm just trying to hone in on that mm -hmm. and not just paint what people want me to paint because sometimes I'll get people that say, oh, can you paint me some blue bonnets? So I'm like, no, I don't paint blue bonnets. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can refer you to my sister who does. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, um, to that point where I will say no. There's a lot of power in the word no, yes. and I'm exercising that a lot <laughs> um, because I'm, I'm 50 and 
getting ready to turn 51, and I'm at the point in my life where I'm not, I'm not for the BS. I'm just not for it. <laughs> and I'm ex exercising the power of the word no. <laughs> Um, and doing the things that I want to do, not what someone else wants me to do. And that even goes back to when I was in college because as a creative person, I've always been a creative person, but I've always been taught by my parents to, you have to get a job, something that you can make money at, okay? I've always been a very creative person. I've always walked to the beat of my own drum. So of course when I go to school, I'm in school as a pre-med major and I promptly flunk because <laughs> <laughs> not my thing, you know. So I explored various things and ended up in architecture, which I love, and then I made the decision after three and a half years of spending my parents' money on architecture school, um, I decided to change my major to art. <laughs> And they promptly told me, <laughs> what are you going to do with an art degree? <laughs> and I said, I am going to live. I am not going to exist. So I have been existing through my art, doing various odd jobs and taking on different things just to survive. My husband is the primary breadwinner, has always been the primary breadwinner because he's been extremely supportive of me being an artist, but I have taught school off and on for 10 years, actually more like 20 years, <laughs> and yeah, 20 years I've taught, um, I still teach group fitness, that was something else that I backed into uh, as a way to make money, I uh, teach various forms of group fitness, um, I've done multi-level marketing, Young Living, Pampered Chef, Beach Body, <laughs> just and everything just as a means to try to hang on to mm -hmm. the dream of being an artist because unfortunately the things that we tell our kids is that art is not a real job. <laughs> it's just a hobby. And I'm here to tell you, I'm an artist. It's a real job. And all these ladies up here can tell you art is a job. It is not a hobby. So um, if there's anything that you can take from us we are working our asses off mm -hmm. as artists, mm -hmm. as artists, <laughs> not as artists, as people doing a hobby. Mm -hmm. This is this 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 is our livelihood. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll leave that leave that right there. <laughs> I want to throw in real quick. Oh, my quick is a quote. It's that I struggle a lot with consumption, so the only choice is to consume me. So that is take it how you like. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's a very good question because the idea of how an artist is to support oneself is usually the the straw that'll break the camel's back. Mm -hmm. Most people won't even decide to be an artist because just the thought of where how they're going to make money is terrifying. Me, the thought of having a job is terrifying. The thought of someone telling me what to do all day long is terrifying. I mean, I am really a person that's terrified by that. But the flip side of that and me being a professional artist full time is that it's one of the most fearful things one will have to do. Why do I say that? Because making art is one thing. Earning a living from the art you make is a different story. Art as a business is a different story. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, um, artists are encouraged, do it, do it, people go. And a lot of, you'll get more no's than you will yeses. Mm -hmm. For me personally, I have a, um, several lines that cater to um, uh, the, uh, churches, uh, rainbow series for the gay and lesbian community. Uh, breast cancer survivor pieces. I have a lot of different, I do uh, artwork for a lot of sororities and fraternities and things like that. So I have a lot of markets that sustain me. Even in uh, me having all those different lines and all those different markets where I sell art, I still have to be vigilant at taking the time
to trust that I'm going to sit here and paint something that no one has any idea what this is about. They can't recognize it and it's going to serve me. I, I still, in, in, in the midst of all the markets and all the followings that I have on my art that sustain my, my lights and me and my children and me earning a living, I still have to do art that that is from internal. Mm -hmm. I still have to make the time to do that. And one thing about artists, we like to make the art, we like to be quiet about it, but we don't like to get on social media. Mm -hmm. We don't like to go tell people, buy my art, hey mm -hmm. look, this is where, you know, when it starts, when it comes to placing a value on what we do, that's a whole nother ball game. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so I'm here to tell you all, as artists, because art, you won't usually hear the artists say this, you'll hear the advocates say this for us. We need supporters. We need investors. Art is an asset. When you buy art, it's not like your curtains or your, your pretty bed spread that's gonna, you know, change colors and the wall, you know, the color of your walls will change. But your art is an investment. It's an asset. You can have your art appraised. It's part of your wealth. And people need to know that art is valuable. That's something one thing we don't we don't know. My children, they do little pieces of art on different things. I save it all. My mentor, Frank Frazier, one thing he taught me at the, the very first day I met him was always draw on good paper mm -hmm. and use good materials. Because mm -hmm. you never know what you're creating. Mm -hmm. So we, we as artists, we have a responsibility to show people that it's valuable. Mm -hmm. And that means standing up to the criticism that you may get. You may, I may post a picture with me, you know, with some pretty jeans on, with my, my little booty poked out. I'll get a million likes, but if it's me showing here some art by this, it's like, you know? And it's like, y'all, y'all, okay, y'all see me like this, but y'all didn't see this art though. You know what I'm saying? My body will change, my art will remain forever. I will die, I will pass on, but when I'm gone, my art will be here. Mm -hmm. So we have to, as artists, speak loudly, you know, and and don't be ashamed by the criticism and don't be dismayed by the uh, the people that just don't know. Mm -hmm. But the world is called on is calling on creative people because creativity is an intelligence. I'll say that again. Creativity is an intelligence. So if you are a creative person, you can think your way outside of a box. Mm -hmm. You can think your way into a solution for your life. Mm -hmm. So we forget how valuable and how strong of a component creativity is. That's one thing I emphasize in my workshops that I teach with young people and old people alike, is that if you have creativity and you have imagination, you have everything you need, essentially. You can go so many more places. So I'll just leave it at that. But the audaciousness and not worrying about people buying it, but at the same time saying, hey, look, I need y'all to buy this. <laughs> you know, you have, you have to tell people what you need. They don't know. They don't, they don't, most people look at me, they don't know that <clears throat> when they buy this piece, that's part of my light bill money. That's part of the food on the table for my children. They're not going to know that. They may think we're doing it for a hobby, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm one that's very clear. I'll go on live and I'll say, hey, look, y'all better buy my art while it's $10 because in a minute, you know, um, uh, you know, Obama will have my art. You know, yeah. there's going to be so many famous people that have my art. Then you're going to come back and be like, hey, can I get your art? And you had a chance to get it, but you thought I was playing. And, and as artists, we have to talk, you have to talk that, cl that clear. Who else is going to speak for us? Who else is going to do it? So, you know, it's not a matter about being shameless. It's, it's, you know, I'm speaking for my unborn great-grandchildren. They, they, they're not even here yet. You know, so I'm speaking for them today. And if we just remember our, our future and, and, and our past and, and what we need today to make this reality, this dream a reality, then we'll say what we need to say, artists. Yeah. I'll say this. Um, for me... I started painting back in um, 2014, and I didn't really know what it was that I was supposed to paint, so I assumed that the only way that I could make money was doing commissions. 
Um, so my very first commission, someone asked me to paint Jesus, actually. And it was this really big piece. It was three by four feet. I spent over 60 hours working on this. And when I showed them, they didn't like it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was heartbroken. It's like I had just started. And so I almost just stopped. Like I stopped for a really long time. I was like, okay, this isn't for me then. Like, I don't know what else to do. I ended up feeling very just in a box. I felt frozen. I felt like I couldn't do anything. So I ended up actually going to therapy. Um, <laughs> um, I ended up going to this therapist. And by the way, I had to pick a black therapist because I, I was like, I need somebody that knows my life. And so um, she said, you know, I keep getting artists. Um, that come to me that are stuck and they don't know where to go and um, she was able to really help me through that block because I, I had so many ideas and things that I wanted to do I wanted to celebrate black women in my art I wanted to be able to tell my story but I just felt guilty I felt like well you know what if no one buys it what if that's not what everybody wants mm -hmm. but she just told me like it's okay to just express yourself and just feel free in that and I've definitely been lucky that people have, you know, liked my art so far. Um, I know that for me, growing up, I'm, I'm from Tulsa, I'm from Oklahoma, and I didn't see art that looked like me growing up. And um, I remember when I was in high school, um, my mom was like, okay, you need to take care of yourself now. You have your little job making $5.25 an hour. You know, get your own hair done and all that stuff. I was like, I don't have money to get my hair done. So I actually went natural. I cut all my hair off, had really short hair. And it was like, nobody else looked like me in high school. And I got made fun of. My own mom made fun of me. It was like this whole thing of trying to find my own beauty. Mm -hmm. And so in my art, I just want to celebrate women but black women because I'm basically creating the art that I needed to see mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, I think that it was um, it's been like a like like we said up here it's definitely been therapy for me um, a lot of times people come to an art show and they see my work and they're like well who is that and I'm like it's nobody it can be whoever you want it to be it doesn't have to be a certain person like we can uplift ourselves it can be the average normal everyday woman that's okay um and so as far as you know talking about making art that you know people want i definitely have learned to say no i feel stifled i feel like i can't you know do exactly what i want to do people look at my work and they see black women and say okay but can you paint my dog and i'm like no <laughs> you know i get a lot of crazy requests and i just had to say no I'm on like this mission where I have to get this out. Like I have so much that I want people to see. Um, and so right now my work is speaking about vulnerability. I feel like as black women, a lot of times we have all these negative connotations mm -hmm. or always seen as strong, which to me can be negative because that's a lot to carry on yourself to always be that strong black woman. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we need somebody to hold us up and support us. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't feel like we're always allowed to be soft or we're seen as pretty or you know vulnerable so that's what I like to show in my work and so um, right now I do not accept commission <laughs> I don't like it like she said I, if you don't want to buy my art that is fine and I get a lot of people like on um, social media that will say well I think you're racist because all you do is paint you know black people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said, well, you can, okay, that's fine. I mean, you don't like it. Racism. Actually, no racism is prejudice with power. Right? <laughs> I just feel like if it's a white artist and all they paint are white people, they don't get the same response. No, they don't. Yeah. And it's not my job to be <laughs> inclusive of everybody. Mm -hmm. I can paint what I want to paint as an artist, and if you want something specific, find an artist that does it, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. I've been doing the actual art for two years. I've been doing paper jewelry for five years. And, but when I was two, uh, since I was two, I've been singing. And being a singer, um, you know, just growing up, you know, people really loved to hear me sing, but it was always like, um, you know, people would be my friend because 
I could sing, you know, they would invite me, girl, come to this party. I'm like, okay. And I get there and it's because they wanted me to sing somebody happy birthday and they wanted them to be impressed. You know, stuff, going through things like that. So uh, in my mid twenties, I kind of went through a period where I was just like, I don't want to, I drop the music. Like, I don't want to sing. I don't, right now I just want to get to know who I am and do, you know, how to do things that I actually want to do so that whenever I do get back into whatever art that I decide that I want to do, then I'm inviting people to a seat at my table, you know, where I get to share who I am with them. And then if they're inspired by it, then they can take away whatever they're going to take away from it. And so um, from the beginning, you know, even starting with my paper jewelry, I was just, you know, people would say, oh, can you do this or do that? And, you know, at, I immediately kind of started to discourage that because I, I was just like, you know, this is, this is a piece of who I am. You know, I can't, I, even though it's interesting to see other people's perspective, I can never entirely know exactly what it is that someone else is thinking or, you know, what they perceive that it should be. The only perspective that I know for sure is my own. So it's easier to share my own perspective and then allow that person to be inspired off of it. So even with my art now, I just, I don't, I've, I've never accepted like any kind of commission work or anything like that. I'm just like, this is, this is me sharing a piece of me with you and hoping that you enjoy it. <coughs> that be the opposite perspective. I've done many commissions. I've mm -hmm. done mural commissions, I've done portraits, I've done montages, I do children, illustration. I've done many, many, many commissions. That's been pretty much the beginning of my entire art career. That's how I found out that it could be done. I didn't even realize I was an artist until I was actually creating something. And someone was like, oh, can you, can you make that for me? And it inspired me through me speaking, I guess, to other people through what I would do. And I found out my abilities through like instructors like James Kemp. I was actually, actually mm -hmm. out of Hoffman College. I'm a Hoffman uh, undergrad. And he was the one that actually told me what I could do. I had no clue. So for me, I've always, because I'm a teacher, I'm a teacher because I need to have the money and consistency and you know all of those things. But I've had the beauty of being able to utilize that platform also. So as I'm inspiring the children, mm -hmm. then I get opportunity to actually use what it is that I do. So for me, in this, I, I, I'll be 50 this year as well. And so in learning about myself, teaching other people, I have just gotten to the point to where I feel, okay, now it's time for me to tell my story. Mm -hmm. Now I can actually release everything, and it's so much, it's overwhelming about mm -hmm. uh, that's in here. And I have the, the freedom to do that. It still will take time, you know, and, and the patience has to be there. But in terms of, you know, I, I can't remember who it was long ago that had this question, okay, original or print, original or print, original or print. And, you know, they're like, well, if you sell the prints, then you're going to diminish the value of the original, mm -hmm. and then, or commission or not commission. And so I've always been given that question, but just allowing myself to kind of almost do a free flow through what life opportunities actually are I'm exposed to or the things that come my way. So some, some commissions I won't do. You know, it just really depends on the subject matter and my feeling that, you know, um, maybe what it's going to benefit. And then sometimes I will do things absolutely free. It just really depends on what it is and its purpose because sometimes having the voice to speak comes out of being able to give it. And so I've been able to actually have an audience and be able to influence simply because of my design as to whether I, you know, I give this or whether I take the commission because it puts me in the, in the position where I can actually have conversation and get open up. I'd, I'd like to share something, Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. And I'm going to read it so it comes directly from Gandhi, but through my voice. And he says, you find yourself when you lose yourself in giving service to others. And I want to attach that to something that's beyond the impact of having money from the art. 
and impact, impacting something that has gone through each and every one of us. I don't know if I've ever met a single person in life that did not have a mental issue. We need mindfulness. And I'm going to say through art, through art, that mental health and wellness is probably the most powerful thing on earth. Yes. Yes. To be able to look at a visual image, or to, or to hear the voice of a lovely artist, or to listen to the voices of these artists here, is an impact that is greater than Netflix. <laughs> and, and, and all our children, and even as adults, we watch Netflix. And Netflix is touted as the greatest industry on the face of the earth. But I'm going to cast out a challenge to each and every one of you and all of us here on the panel. And that is to overshadow the entertainment industry through the arts as an education catalyst. Ladies and gentlemen, support artists. <laughs> My own um, personal story in regards to that is um, when I was in college, I think maybe more so in graduate school, is when I decided that I was definitely not going to make work to sell, or that wasn't going to be my intent. Um, and then when I started being in shows, people would buy the work, and I'd be like, wait, like, but it's not supposed to sell. <laughs> um, and it's not that I wasn't trying to, you know, sure, if someone wants to buy it, fine. But I think the point is, um, that I learned through that, that I could, that my voice, my unique kind of story is actually valuable, mm -hmm. you know? And then if we give ourselves that opportunity to just share what it is that we feel that we need to say, um, that there's always someone out there, you know, that is like, oh, I think that, you know? It may not be as many people as you would like it to be, but that was, that was definitely an eye-opening experience for me. Um, so, you know, I'm just thinking, oh, no, I'm just making this work. This is what I'm going to say. I don't care. <laughs> and, you know, walk in the show and, like, there's that on the work. And like, you're just like, wait a minute now. <laughs> I thought that, you know, this was, this was just about me, you know. But then you don't always realize that, you know, what you're saying is speaking to other people as well. And, um to the point about collecting, you know, and how important that is. Um, especially within our community, I think that uh, that's oftentimes a missed opportunity, you know, that um, I think it's a shame if people from our community can't collect our art, and it happens a lot. Um, you know, back when I used to sell my work for like pennies or whatever, <laughs> Um, I would have loved for people to have just been like, oh, I just want to support you. Um, and now that it's kind of, you know, progressed further, um, then it's kind of like people say, oh, I don't want to buy your art because they see that you're, you know, you're doing okay. <coughs> um, and then it's like, okay, well, this is what it, the value of it is now. And so um, that notion that Tyler was saying about, like, don't miss out, don't, it's real. And our, our artists, um, that go on and that you see them in the museums, that happens all the time, you know. And then, then our community complains. Well, I, I just don't understand why I can't, you know, just can't just sell it to me for this. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of artists are wrapping their heads around, well, what's a way that I can, um, as my career progresses, how can I still make room to, um, that my community can still afford my work. You know, as my body keeps escalating. Um, so I would just say, you know, uh, that that point of supporting, that's why I love uh, supporting student artists, um, especially black student artists, because it's like, it is very encouraging, you know, to um, just to know that, you know, at this, at that stage, you know, or emerging artists that people are supporting is it's really critical. But yeah, I would definitely, definitely stress, you know, <laughs> that we all need to do a better job of collecting art, mm -hmm. you know, and supporting our, our artists. And I'll say to, oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> on that. Um, 
when I was a student uh, in high school, my principal at the time, uh, George King, he bought a work for me, and that was everything. Mm -hmm. It was at that moment that I knew that I can do this, mm -hmm. and I will do this. Mm -hmm. So it, I, I think we can't stress, stress enough the importance of supporting our kids, our youth, mm -hmm. um, especially the ones in the art, you know, just, just like, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> my sixth grade teacher, I think it was my, yeah, I think it was my sixth grade teacher was the person that mm. encouraged me. She said, I think we've got something here. Um, I didn't make it past ninth grade. I didn't make it past ninth grade. I left school ninth grade. I left home when I was 13. I've been on my own since then. Art, if I didn't make art, then I I don't know <laughs> I don't know what I would have been doing, but um, saved me number one, mm -hmm. but it also fed me. <laughs> and I'm getting emotional because I didn't have a choice, but I knew that um, I wasn't going to be on drugs. I wasn't going to prostitute. I wasn't going to do what I saw in my community in D.C. and in Baltimore. Um, Fortunate enough to have like drug dealers were flipping my artwork and strippers were buying my artwork. <laughs> <laughs> that was cool. Um, so I still support and they still support me too, you know, in, in that type of way. And it was cool to see like, you know, them coming up and being like, all right, I'm gonna get this block and I'm gonna flip your art on this, you know, and just kind of flipping in that type of way. Um, but to have gone and been homeless and to be in Miami and being homeless or being in DC and being homeless and never once beg, but always taking crayons or pencils or whatever and even going on a piece of napkin, mm -hmm. selling that. Mm -hmm. Just selling a napkin to somebody with art on it. I don't know if they still have it. I don't know who has it, you know, or who has them because there's several, but just having that um, and I like money, so I don't really say no too often unless it's something I absolutely know that I, I'm not feeling or I know that I cannot, do, I can't produce that particular vision. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I will because I always think that that's adding to my mm -hmm. arsenal, my choke arsenal, as I call it, but my arsenal of skills that I can do. Mm -hmm. um, but, but for me, it was never a choice. And I would, I would paint things that I thought people would like. I always paint things that I know that I would like, but I always, if I got a commission, I would say, have you seen my artwork? Because this is what it's going to come out looking like right? in my style. I'll paint your portrait, but it's going to be colorful and all the, in my style. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, and they have to be okay with that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, in, in regards to is it, you know, is it a survival? If I didn't do this, I wouldn't eat or I, didn't, or I wouldn't have a place to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, this thing has taken me around the world. I've been to Greece and Turkey and sold my art and showed my art. I've been to Thailand and beyond and to Japan. I mean, all these things that these hands have taken me there. And again, just standing firm in who I am and what I am and why I'm doing this. I don't, I don't, it, it chose me. It's, it's here. It's coming out. Um, and same fear, having somebody else tell me what to do. I can't. Then, you know, I've had those types of jobs. I've had really interesting, lots of security type jobs, but to, to, to be in that box is very, is very scary to a very creative person. Mm -hmm. You will die every side, every single day inside if you don't get out and create. So, yeah. I want to share a treasure chest. A little white boy in one of my educational moments came to visit a place where I was displaying some art. And never in the wildest dreams of the director of that kid did they think that he would be interested in the art. They invited him to go downstairs to a play zone, without calling the name. This kid walks into the play zone and it's fabulously decorated out with all kinds of plastic toys, and no stimulating images. 
And the kid walks back to his director in my presence and says, and, she, and the director said to the kid, what did you think about the entertainment facility? And the kid said, that's basic. <laughs> he says to the director, do you mind if I walk around in here? And he didn't see color. And he certainly may not at that time have been able to understand the value, but he saw art. And the art was African-American art made, but universally displayed. And the kid said, and that's my future. I'd like to say that Jennifer Obama my first piece of <laughs> I did. Um, I saw these classy, um, I've known classy since she was little, since she was a little girl, um, and classy babysit for us and did some child care at a startup church that my husband did maybe about 16, 17 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, longer than that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and she took photos of my oldest daughter, Indigo, who is now 20. And Indigo was probably about three at the time. And when I saw the photos, they were just gorgeous. I mean, simply gorgeous. And I told class, I'm like, you need to have a show. <laughs> and she had a show at your, at your parents' house, right? No, it was at Clean was it? South Dallas. It where? Clean South Dallas. Okay. And I showed up, and I said, I want to buy these from you. I didn't want her to just oh, give them oh. to me. I wanted to buy them from her. Mm -hmm. So I bought both photos that she did of of our youngest daughter, Indigo, and they're still hanging up in my house now. I, they're just absolutely gorgeous. They're just gorgeous. And I can't stress enough to just support, support, su support, especially um, young artists, especially um, all of us, <laughs> but also our young. Our young. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and our young, because uh, like my, my kids, they're all creative. And when I would have an art show, I remember, I'll never forget, I was, uh, we were do I was doing uh, a home studio tour, um, you know, when I lived in Oak Cliff, and we, we were, I was part of the Oak Cliff Artisans. Mm -hmm. And there was probably about 20 of us, and each of us had a stop, and my house was one of the stop, my studio. And my, um, my child, <laughs> my little daughter, Indigo, she, she, when I put my panels up and had my studio all decorated and everything and all nice, ready for the tour, this girl went and tacked her art <laughs> on the trees outside and put like a million dollars on it. <laughs> yes. Her little stick figure, she, she just tacked on a tree. Her teacher came through and the people were buying her stuff. <laughs> and I just told them, I said, she doesn't understand the concept of what a million dollars is, but $10 is a million dollars for her. And they were paying her like $10, $20 for her little, her little mm, crumpled up piece of paper. So, yeah. <laughs> so just the value of that, because she is now 20, and she's a jeweler. Mm -hmm. And um, she's selling her stuff. And just like even my baby girl, Willow, she's 16. She sold her first painting when she was 30. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, she saw her first painting when she was three because I've always been very inclusive of including my, my kids in my art shows. And like my girls up there manning our booth right now because they know the drill. <laughs> but when I have shows at home, I include my kids and I say, okay, I, you can draw. And I, I just encourage them because art is important. It's very, very important. <laughs> very important. So like like the other ladies were saying, you know, buy, just support, and support those young artists that are out there, the student artists, because like Tara said, you know, our art might be like $10, some of our, most of our art is not $10, but, um, <laughs> yeah, just, you know, it's going to be up there, because like one of the artists that's in the show, her name is Evita Tizano. I met Evita, like 20 plus years ago. We were, there are several of uh, Frank Frazier's art daughters up here, mm -hmm. but Evita's another one of Frank's art daughters. And we would travel all over the country selling his art and our art. Mm -hmm. And I remember when Evita's art pieces, like her larger pieces, were like 200 bucks. Someone 
had the audacity to tell her to complain why one of her five by seven pieces, one of her five by seven collage pieces is like 600 bucks. Someone was complaining about the price of her artwork. And I was just taken aback. I'm like, but your price is your price. Mm -hmm. It's your price. You know, they cannot determine the price of your art that you poured your blood, sweat, and tears into and your experiences into your art. And then they have the audacity to complain about the price that you put on your art. They should have bought it back then. If that's not convenient to them, they should have bought it back then when, it was, when a big piece was 200 mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so. And now Denzel has so much. Yes, yes, now several. Denzel, several. several. Denzel has her artwork, several. several. <laughs> so at this time, thank you all. Um, I want to extend um, questions from the audience. If you have any questions for our panel. If not, then we'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I would like to say I enjoy what, what each of you said. Inspiration is best expressed by the inspired. So I look at black art, specifically black women art, as no different than you choosing to be a heart surgeon, which is a specialist, mm -hmm. or a dentist, which is another specialist. Mm -hmm. uh, so I get that. I mean, um, and I'm inspired by that. Um, and then the other question I had is, uh, whoever wants to answer, what is your inspiration? What inspires you to create? And some of you have already expressed it. I'm going to respond to that. First, this is my auntie. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you were talking, Jennifer, I thought about that last question. I was quiet on it because uh, it was one of those situations where I was like, can I answer that question yet? Because I'm not quite... Um, but when you said something, I was like, I do have to respond to that, and it gives me space to respond to her question, too. I sold my first piece of art when I was four years old. Um, it was paper origami flowers in the classroom. Um, and I didn't sell it for inspiration. I sold it for lunch money. <laughs> um, and I sold a lot of art from age four all the way up to age 18 for money, you know? Um, I loved it though. It was something that I was passionate about, but it was all for money. Um, and so when I think about like this question around inspiration, the interesting thing about art for me was uh, even though I was doing it for money, and that was straight up. <laughs> I was selling cartoons for money. I would, if y'all were my friends, um, I would make a little cartoon of you, I would put your name on it in a particular script, and then I would sell it. Or I would sell fashion designs or whatever. Mm -hmm. Whatever I needed to do to get the extra money, that's what I did. Um, but as far as inspiration, I, I called out that the fact, this is my aunt, and I called that out because um, when I was a little girl, she had this huge sketch of herself. So she's an artist. Um, and when I was little, like the concept of an artist, I didn't really get that. I just saw things and I was like, oh, I want to do that. And so that's what I did. It wasn't to be an artist. It was just kind of like, oh, that's pretty. <laughs> I'm going to do that. Oh, I want to have a, a skirt and I want it to look this way. So I'm going to sew this. Um, and so the struggle for me with art was the fact that like I didn't get the concept of being an artist. Mm -hmm. I just knew I'd like to create stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I would have people like my aunt or like my mother um, or my friend or whoever and they would do something cool. And then I was like, okay, I want to do that cool thing too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so as far as like inspiration, I'm a person who's literally inspired by life. Mm -hmm. I'm inspired by a conversation. I'm inspired by like a flower. Um, and then I want to create. And so I'm now, just now, at 34, starting to understand the concept of an artist, mm -hmm. realizing that I've spent my life being an artist, mm -hmm. but not knowing it. Yeah. 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 I want to, to expound upon that. 
like you said, you live your life being the artist, but not creating, but not really identifying as an artist per se. Well, I'm, I'm I had a different uh, experience as a child. I've always experienced my life knowing that I am an artist and trying to figure out what I could do to keep this. Mm -hmm. And even when it was time to go off to college, you know, I used to draw as a child and, and, and make money with it and I had drawings. All. I was known for being an artist and I would draw things and give it to people and sign and say, hey, look, keep, you want to keep this. Because one day I'm going to be very famous and it's going to be worth a lot of money. And I still have friends to this day who have reminded me that they still have those pieces and they're watching me in this. So I say all that to say, I'm living my dream. I am literally doing what I said I was going to do as a child. And that's my inspiration, is keeping my word to myself. And not really understanding how I did it, but just knowing in my heart that I never let it go, even when I went off to school and I saw, okay, I picked criminal justice, but then I got to UNT and I was like, man, I can be an artist? Like, I was never told in the small town of Midland, Texas growing up that we're never told that art is a choice, which is why I now have my Art Boss workshop so I can tell children, you can pick art today. You can pick art now and that you can be an artist later. I mean, you can continue to be an artist. You never have to give it up. So my inspiration is, is keeping my word to myself and, and now teaching other children that you can say, hey, I want to do this. this. This will be one of the things I do, and you can do it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a big deal to me. And I, and I actually, um, I'm humbled by it, but I, I boast about it too. It's a big deal. Oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. Very quickly, you said my inspiration. Oh, no, that it's like you said, life, Ms. Joe Lachey. And I'm very passionate about the idea that we alter our own images and until the story, what did they say? Until the story of the hunt is told by the lion, the hunter will always get the glory. So that whole idea of being able to self-determine, um, that question about, like, does it matter that if you're in these spaces? So that that is where I draw like a lot of inspiration from. That, it doesn't matter to me because I'm the lion and I want to tell my story. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so. I think for me, I don't know if inspiration is quite the word as much as it's uh, survival or healing. Mm -hmm. I just, I noticed um, from a very young age, I, whenever I created, I felt better. Whatever mm -hmm. trauma or whatever hurt or anything that was big in my life that happened, I would create and I would feel better. So whether my mom with her cancer or my brother dying at a very young age, I would create and I would, I would feel better. Mm -hmm. um, there's just a sense of um, healing myself through art. I've never been one with the loudest voice or to talk a lot in school. Um, I've always grown up in spaces where I am the only. And art for me was this platform that I could get everything that I wanted to get out, but would never say mm -hmm. on a canvas, and I feel better. Mm -hmm. It's just a way for me to feel better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for me, the transition from being an artist that made money and was famous to becoming an artist that had an opportunity to share. It's each and every one of those aha moments that I experienced you know, even, even yesterday here, someone would say, so, so what's the name of this painting and what does it mean? Mm -hmm. I said, I don't know, why don't you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> and they say, I see this and I see that. And they start to share how it makes them feel. And in each and every one of those stories, there's a therapy. Mm -hmm. There's a level of mental wellness that I hear from the person that's describing what the art I produced me means to them. And so it is those aha moments that make me go back and continue to paint. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the audience? Oh. Okay. <laughs> have y'all been talking about how y'all get art to sell? Like, have y'all had any problems with like, making art to sell? Did you ever want to give up? I think that's 
Oh, no, no, no. I just oh, said I don't think I've ever wanted I, to give up. <laughs> I, I have a few pieces that I have decided not to give up, and I love it when people come by and they want to make me try to give it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a very, um, like there's a piece that Frank and I did one day. I invited him on, like, Frank, come have lunch. Let's collaborate. I don't collaborate. I don't collaborate. I mean, I mean, I don't, yeah. He had a lot to say about that, but I promised him soup and salad. I'll make some soup. And we sat out in the sun and created this piece called Deep Waters. It has a, uh, it had the graphic images of his slave ship and then my three dimensional sculpture with pipe coverings. Like this really cool piece that I thought he and I could do, and we ended up doing it, uh, creating it together. And for a couple of years, I had it for sale, but it, it didn't feel right pricing it. I never felt comfortable with the price. I didn't like the fact that as soon as I put it out, I didn't sell it. I, I felt like it was that valuable, it should have sold. And those are the kind of things as artists, we put things out that we think are valuable and that they should sell at the very minuscule price that we put on it, and then it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So I have a few pieces that I have taken it personal that people should have bought and they did buy them and now they're in my family um, heirloom, they're a family heirloom um, and they have, these pieces now have created a value of their own that, that cannot mm -hmm. be surpassed by any dollar amount and, and I think as artists it's very important that we, we allow pieces a certain amount of time to sell and after that, that's it. If we get attached to it, we're attached to it. It's ours. It goes to our grandchildren. And make sure you tell your children, I'm attached to this piece, and this is why. Our children should know the stories of the pieces. Mm -hmm. They should be able to tell those stories to others. So, yes, it's okay. that's okay. It happens. <laughs> um, to you, just to finish off that thought, the pieces that don't sell, that you're attached to, have you considered donating them to this museum? <laughs> that way, um, it's available for everybody and you to come back and reconnect with them. But, but it's a uh, picture. I forget the name of it. I can never think of the name of it. Feed me, feed me, and it's a a a, a design or image of the chest imprint, and it denotes. Uh, it has the two. It's a body print of Jennifer's, and it has both breasts look like people turned opposite or, or, or turned away and then it has like this heart going in between and it it signifies um, the relationship between being a mother, the breast having dual meaning uh, for, for, for nurturing for life and as also as a mother, as a wife. So it's, it's a very powerful piece that I hope she does so many more <laughs> because uh, it's a big message in it. Very powerful piece. Beat me. My favorite uh, artist. This was one of my first, first favorite. I have many favorite. I mean, we all do. We all have favorites. Um, one of my earliest, earliest favorite artists was Ernie Velez, the Puerto Rican um, graffiti artist from New York City, and he's my favorite because he, he's. Him, along with so many others, were what I wanted to be when I grew up. And essentially, I, I did. I, I did graffiti art and I still do graffiti art for, for so many years. And I don't, many of you might not know, but I don't show my face on social media. So this is going to be a tough one, being recording this. But um, uh, he just, he really embodied that, that New York style and um, and really spoke to me in a certain type of way. But yeah, I, I wanted to aspire to be that way and just express myself out in the streets and in, in front of everybody and everything, but then no one knowing who did it. Mm -hmm. I, lo I love that, mm -hmm. you know? I didn't care about who saw it, I just wanted people to see it, you know? So, Ernie Velez for me. For me, it would probably be the first piece that I ever purchased because I, I collect also. Um, in the first, in the piece that I collected, the first piece that I actually bought, it was a uh, limited edition piece when I ran an art gallery. Um, when Stephanie Ward uh, had the had two art galleries, one was called Stephanie Two mm -hmm. in Plano, and the other one was Stephanie's collection in Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. And I saw this beautiful print with all these vivid colors, and it was 
It's called Three Sisters by Lee White, by the artist Lee White. So that's my favorite piece because I, that was the first piece that I purchased and it's a limited edition um, serigraph. But original artwork will have to be all my Frank Frazier's because <laughs> Frank is my, is my art daddy and <laughs> he has gifted me with gifted me with himself with mm -hmm. all these beautiful pieces just from the goodness of his heart <laughs> mm -hmm. and I it's hard to pick one because they're all so different and mm -hmm. I just and I'm, I'm excited because um, I just remembered um, about a month ago that Frank gifted me um, his uh, Gory Allen mm -hmm. set mm -hmm. um, from, from way, way back mm -hmm. um, on the Middle Passage. Mm -hmm. And I just framed each and every last oh, one of them. Oh, you them all? I framed them all. It's 16, <laughs> it's, it's 15 it's, panels. Yeah. 15 panels, and I'm going to hang them in my house. Um, when I received them, our kids were very, very small. And my husband was looking at him, he's like, we not hanging that up because <laughs> it's a lot of nudity. And I don't have a problem with nudity um, because there's a difference between nakedness and nudity. And and I just saw the beauty. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm excited because I'm going to hang them up now. And I would say I guess I would say that's like my favorite, because I'm going to actually see it hanging after 15 years of it being in a box. So I would say that's probably my favorite right now because I'm going to actually see them hanging in the grid. Yeah. Um, uh, my favorite piece of work that I don't own <laughs> is Carrie Mae Weems. I love Carrie Mae Weems, her kitchen table series. She is the originator of the meme, what we know as the meme. She's a photographer who did like um, typography on her photographs. It still does. You probably know her. What's her most famous work? The people with the red. Anyway, uh, she's a photographer who also deals a lot with consumption. I love her. My favorite work though is the original that I owe, probably Frank Frazier, right? He put down his art on his back. And he like talks a lot of stuff, but he means it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he, you know, he, he pays it for it. And he's a brilliant artist. Uh, I don't have any original work in Jimmy, so I don't know what Jimmy's work. Uh, my brother, my children. My favorite actual work is mothering. That's my actual, I'm torn about it, but mothering is the work I see every day. <laughs> Okay, I'll go. So, <laughs> my favorite work of art sits in my home sometimes. And, and it's, it goes places that I, I can't even keep up with. And unfortunately for me today, it sits in this room. <laughs> But, but, but it left the room just now, and I was holding out <laughs> so that it could be in the room for me to share. And my favorite art is my daughter. And she just left the room, but I want to share with you. She, she called me into her room one day. She was living in Florida, and I went to visit. And, and she says, Mom, scratch my back. I said, I don't want to do that. She, she said, please, it's really itching. And she asked me about three or four times. And finally I acquiesced to it and I said, okay, fine, where does it itch? And she says, right here, right here. And I proceeded to scratch her back. And as I did so, I saw the name Nicole tattooed <laughs> on her back. Ladies and gentlemen, my daughter, Jasmine. <laughs> and then I have one other piece that is not as mobile. <laughs> and it is by an artist named Dimsey. I don't know if anybody in here is familiar with that artist. Dimsey is, is from way back in the day. I'd be lying if I t tell you what year, but I'm sure it was from back in the 60s. It, it was a piece that was gifted to me. And it was gifted to me in the 90s, in fact, attached with my daughter. And, and it was gifted to me by my daughter's father. And he said, I want to give this to you in honor of you 
producing such a wonderful piece of art. And I looked at it, and I looked at my baby, and I said, I, I, I picked door number one. Because when I tell you that piece was so ugly, in my mind at the time, until I became a professional artist, and I started to utilize mindfulness, and I started to see in that art what is not the perfect lines, and the best colors, and the straightest images, and that have some huge value attached to it. But it was something that brought me what I stand on today, art that is my therapy. Yes. I'd like to um, actually echo what Tashana, <laughs> echo what Tashana said, that uh, my, the artist that I, I like the best is God. Because for the exact same reason that you just said, that his creation is not perfect, mm -hmm. and it's random, and it's, it's free, and it flows, and it's just all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I think as I've been an artist, you know, I've had people tell me, you're just all over the place, you know, because I, I create from my life experiences. I create through things I see or uh, I might hear a song and it just inspires mm -hmm. what it is that I want to do. And I think when I think about the way that I create, I create like my creator, uh, in that I love to see fluidity in the pieces, so you'll see a lot of movement in my pieces, you know, you'll see a lot of clouds in my pieces because I'm actually pulling in those things. And I think even in, in what I see with him looking at us the way we are and then knowing that we're gonna, you know, we're gonna raise up, we're gonna grow, we're gonna increase and all those kind of things, I just think that's the best form of art. Mm -hmm. okay. I guess I'll close it. Um, Favorite piece of art in my house, it's a little abstract art by my nephew. He's about to turn nine. <laughs> um, as far as like a favorite artist, I don't have one, but I do really, really like uh, Mickalene Thomas. Uh, I think she's I have a question, um, partly because I haven't heard my friend Dean Smith speak yet, she's a little <laughs> um, but also because I'm so impressed with the way that she's able to get these large scale um, public art works done. She's got a big thing she's doing for the Houston airport now, and her father did this as well, like he did the, uh, the sculpture that's on the entrance on the way in here, and you see his work like all over town in Houston. And so I kind of two questions about that. Like one, how do you pull that off? Because I'm really impressed. And then secondly, um, when you're making something like that that's gonna be seen by a lot of people that are not artists, like how does that enter into the process? Like how, like is that different from when you're doing something that's gonna be in a museum or that's gonna be your artist friends? Like how do you make something that people are gonna sort of understand or relate to um, that, that are just not even looking for art, it's just right out there in some place public and they run into it? Well, first of all, I knew that you would most possibly say something or make me speak, but um, <laughs> uh, I, uh, to answer the other question, my favorite artist is, uh, I, I won't say my favorite, I have a lot of artists that I love, that I really admire, but my deepest connection is obviously my, my father, my father, George Smith. Um, and I realized that's what I have in my home. Um, I have, I think I've, I have my own work up, <laughs> and my father. Uh, but it's 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 his little models, it's his sketches, it's mm -hmm. his little maybe unrealized pieces. It's his ideas, um, mm -hmm. and just coming into this world, and like even to this day, that that has been a real driving force for me to continue because I have taught, done all these things, and had these different. Things go on in my life, but I've always sort of maintained my artwork. But and I'm not as commercial. Obviously, I would love to make money on my work, but I really love putting the work out there for people to see more than anything else. And as long as you can figure out a way to make a living or, or to sustain yourself while you're doing that and sharing work with the public, I think it's a beautiful thing. I, it's um, it's something I'm coming to know now. I have to hustle a lot, but. The rewards are really great. Um, I love working large scale because my father and the teachers I had in college inspired me to 
a step outside the box, step outside of the pedestal or the podium or the wall or the ceiling and just get large. Mm -hmm. um, an abstraction um, because even sort of stemming back to sort of the roots of like African art, it's, it's very simple, minimal forms that represent a human figure or an animal or a structure. Those things really inspire me as well. It doesn't have to necessarily have to be figurative to reach, to inform, to inspire for people to understand it. But um, those are the things I guess I would say that's right with me. Um, and I don't know. I don't know how people are going to respond to it. I don't know. I have no idea what people are going to think. But I would hope that they would uh, see the power in it and sort of take something away from it. People of all different ethnicities and backgrounds that see my work they see different things in it, and I enjoy that. So even though I have meaning behind my work, I don't necessarily, it's not important to me that everybody stick to that meaning. I want you to sort of draw from, from yourself what you're, what you're coming away from the work with. That's more important to me than anything else. That kind of answers the question a little bit. Let me add this um, about me, uh, about her work. Because when Kaneem came to town, because Kaneem's the only artist that is not from the Metroplex. And when she came to town, it was such a joy to spend that time with her. Well, we did spend extended yes. time together. I really yes. got to know you. I love you dearly. Thank you. <laughs> and we were here until 3 a.m. in the morning, just, just us. Mm -hmm. And just to see her work um, and her hanging that piece, because she hung that piece oh, by herself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just to see her in action and just all the little nuances on um, getting the draping just how she wanted it, it was magical. And even the, the piece on the floor, um, each piece was individually wrapped. And, and she's putting the pieces down and it's like, no, not there. And I mean like just very strategic and where she wanted the pieces mm -hmm. and at that moment once her piece went up i had tears in my eyes and i was just thinking because at the because before i didn't get it i did not get mm -hmm. the power of the show i did not get it tyra knew beforehand because she said this is going to be big she kept telling me she said jennifer she said this is going to be big i didn't see it but at that moment at 3 a.m. in the morning, I looked up at, that, at her piece, and I had tears in my eyes. And I knew at that moment, I was like, this is going to be big. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> that's when I knew it. And then someone came later, maybe like a couple of weeks later after the, after the exhibition opened, and someone wanted to move the piece in the floor, and I was like, oh, hell no. <laughs> you know, like, we were here until 3 a.m. <laughs> you know, I was here, and Kaneem was here, putting these pieces down, and she put the draping just how she wanted, so just the thought of having to move it back, mm -hmm. it, it takes away from her vision, mm -hmm. from what she wanted, mm -hmm. what she wanted for her piece. And when she hangs it, it hangs differently every single time. Mm -hmm. But here is hanging how she wanted to hang in that space mm -hmm. at this time. So wanted to make sure that her vision is upheld. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing I want to say is that with all of us up here, with that exhibition, there's there's this is the place for all of us to shine none of our lights are shining brighter than the others mm -hmm. we're here to shine just as bright as anyone else mm -hmm. and if someone is having a day we're lifting our sister up we're not saying you're just gonna stay down here mm -hmm. this this is a mm -hmm. place and we're at a place where we're lifting each other up because there's a place for all of us to shine we're not dimming our lights for anybody i'm not dimming my light for my light for classic class is going to be shining just bright, right along with me. All of us, we're all shining right here together, loudly, brightly, unapologetically. Yes. Um, and we, and one message that we do want to say, as African American female women, and as artists, and just as women in general, that that whole shaming and mm. backstabbing mm. and jealousy stuff, it has to stop. Yeah. It has to stop. Um, 
And we're here to tell you that we genuinely love each other. Yes. We genuinely love each other. We cannot get enough of each other. We cannot wait. <laughs> <laughs> our, yes, we cannot wait until our next meetup. Because the other thing was important for me that all of us met before mm -hmm. our reception, mm -hmm. which was a couple of months ago. And we met up um, probably at Tyra's house mm -hmm. like a week before. Mm -hmm. And Tashana, when she came mm -hmm. in, she, she was texting me and she said, well, I'm going to be late because she had another show, but she's doing her thing. Mm -hmm. And she said, I'm going to be late. I'm like, come, come, you know, mm -hmm. please come, you mm -hmm. know, because I think we're supposed to be over at 6. Right. We stayed till like, we nine. Stayed till like <laughs> 9, 10, 11, you know, just chit-chatting. And Tarshana was just in tears. And she said, we, were, we just kind of gathered around her and we said, um, what's wrong? And tell what you said. I felt like an island. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, the, as an artist, sometimes you do get in that. But, uh, it's okay. You get in a place where you feel isolated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so... Uh, I just remember walking in there and I just felt the, the love and the, you know, the acceptance and just knowing that I wasn't the only artist out there trying to thrive and mm -hmm. tell the story. And, you know, mm -hmm. it, was, it was just beautiful to see such a wonderful woman, like, like she said, no backstabbing. It wasn't any, you know, competition. It was just like we're all here together and there's a place for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so. Mm -hmm. of you ladies and the other ladies who are not here is has been fulfilling and Missy who who is a photographer who's part of the exhibition as well she said that by saying yes to this exhibition she did not know that it came with a slew of sisters mm -hmm. uh, yeah. oh, I w and I just want to say one more thing to you I want to thank you for bringing up the mental health aspect. Mm -hmm. um, especially in the black community, mm -hmm. mental illness, there's a stigma attached to it, there's a negative connotation attached to it. And it's something we need to talk about openly and honestly, mm -hmm. because I fully agree, because for me, um, just the emotional well-being, if I weren't an artist, I don't know what I'd be doing. Mm -hmm. I'd be in a sane asylum. <laughs> but this, it's, it's my life, my life work, being an artist. Yeah. It gets me up in the morning. Mm -hmm. It makes me want to continue. Are there any other questions from our audience? I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you to all of you phenomenal <laughs> women who are on the stage. <laughs> and my twin sister is a quilt artist. And so she's always saying to me, when I tell her about selling her work, and she's always saying, this is what I love doing. Mm -hmm. So she's gotten to the point where she's kind of in between that selling and, and just making it because she loves it stuff. But I get her now as I sit here and I listen to all of you mm -hmm. about why she do what she do. And she's bringing me along. She's been having me collaborate with her on a couple of weeks. Yeah. So soon I'll be able to come with wow. myself. <laughs> <laughs> by your works, who you are, by what you said yep. on some of them, so that's very interesting. But um, it's, it's great to see you come to life um, through your work um, in person. It's great to see you. Thank you.
our white female counterparts mm -hmm. and our white, specifically our white male counterparts. So I think this is a conversation that we will, that will be ongoing mm -hmm. um, because we definitely have a voice. Um, mm -hmm. We're mothers, we're sisters, um, we're, we're wives. Um, we have stories. Um, we are, all our, our stories are similar, but there's a lot of differences up here. Um, even, um, and I will be brief, because even like with Classy, Classy, Classy comes from a family of artists. Her mother's an artist, her mother is an artist. Um, Miss Vicki, <laughs> Vicki, that's back here, is an artist, and just to, <laughs> where Classy comes from a family of artists, where some of us do not, so it would just be interesting just to hear um, to hear what her experience has been like, you know, as a child growing up from a family of artists, like her brothers are, everybody in her family, they're all artists in some way. And I just find it fascinating. And some of the um, women up here are married to artists. So I, I just think it, even if it's a musician or a photographer or a painter, I just think that that's just an interesting um, conversation to have just to see what is that dynamic, what does that dynamic look like. So, yeah. But thank you all for coming. We really, really, really appreciate each and every one of you um, listening to what we have to say and thinking that it's important. So, thank you. Really appreciate you.